And Father, we thank you again for another good day. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy to us one more time, allowing us to be here. Lord, I thank you again for every person here. And Lord, I pray again that, Lord, you speak to us this morning as only you can do by thy spirit, Lord. We are helpless, Lord, without the Spirit of God. And Lord, I pray for him today. And I pray, Lord, you'll come down and speak to the hearts of people. Oh, Lord, speak to my heart, I pray. Bless our Sunday school hour. Uh, Lord, give us, I pray, direction. Uh, Lord, uh, help our, uh, us, I pray. Uh, Lord, again, we thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we pray that you'll meet with us. May we sense the presence and the power of God. May you do great, and marvelous, and wonderful things today. Lord, I'm, I, I'm always excited about what you're going to do. And Lord, I pray that you will do something great this morning. Lord, help us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. All right, as we get started uh, this morning, did anybody... Think about the question I asked. Did you? Good. How many came up with an answer? Ryan did. Oh, that's right. The question. Here is the question. All right. If Christ died on the cross and paid for all of our sins, and he did, and he did away with the Old Testament law, why then, according to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Malachi, and Ezekiel, why in the millennial age when Christ is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, will there be sacrifices being done in the temple again? The temple that will be built during the millennium, Herod's temple that was here when Jesus was here, uh, will dwarf, I mean, it'll be small in comparison to the temple that will be rebuilt that will be during the millennial age. So the question was, and the question is, why, if Jesus died for all of our sins and paid that for us, why will they be offering sacrifices again during the millennial age when Christ is ruling and reigning in Jerusalem like they did before Christ came? Brenda has an answer. There still will be sin during that time. Because every child born into that time is born in a sinful way. Okay, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, though. Okay, okay. All right. That's okay. All right, go ahead and finish your answer. Go ahead and finish it. I'll let you hang yourself, but go ahead. Well, the sin offerings are for the offerings of sin offerings for those that are born with the sin, but they're still going to be under the same delusion. Oh, no. That during that time, people will have the opportunity to be saved. But just like now, if Jesus were to come down, people aren't going to believe in him. Unless they believe in him, they're not going to believe in him whether he's getting in front of them or if he's in heaven. That's exactly right. And so these people who are offering the offerings aren't putting their trust in Jesus. They're like everyone else right now. There's people who are trying many different ways to get into heaven that won't work. I think it's going to be the same. it's going to help them once they realize there really is a God. Anybody else come up with an answer? All right. Look at Hebrews 10 for a moment. We're not going to go a great deal into this today. But what you've said to me is this, that during the millennial age, when Christ is ruling and reigning in Jerusalem, seated upon the throne of David, while he is there, that they will be offering sin sacrifices in the temple. Now, here's, here's the problem with that. Hebrews 10. We're going to read this, and then, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, 
can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. It is obvious that in the Old Testament, those sacrifices that the priest made never saved anybody. Never. Read on. For them would they not have ceased to be offered. If those sacrifices could make somebody perfect, then they would no longer have had to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It is impossible in the Old Testament law for offerings offered in the temple to take sins away and in the millennium, if it, the same thing it would obviously be true, nobody, no one was ever made perfect by sin offering. Let's read on. Wherefore, when he cometh unto the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared. I want you to jump down to verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering offering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14 is important. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. If you are saved today, if you are saved, you were perfected by the offering of Christ one time. It is obvious that the Old Testament could, in that economy, that the offering of those sacrifices of the blood of bulls and goats could never take away anyone's sins. So now, the question is, what were they for? If no one was ever saved by the Old Testament offerings of the blood of bulls and goats, then what were they for? And, oh, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, okay, I'll, I'll let you answer a second. And if that was the case then, it most surely will be the case in the millennium. So what are they for? Alex? of the covenant that God had made with them, there would be a redeemer that would pay for the sacrifice of their sins. It's, it, it's on the opposite side of the coin as us <clears throat> taking the Lord's table. We, oh. look, we look back, we are, that's the New Testament covenant. We're looking back to the cross. They were making those sacrifices for sin to look forward to the cross. Okay, what that did was, you say? That was a fulfillment of their... I said that they, people in the Old Testament dispensation dispensation never looked forward to the cross they didn't know the cross was going to exist they didn't know christ was going to hang there well isaiah said yes because job said i know that my redeemer liveth and that he shall stand in the latter day uh isaiah of course isaiah 53 most of are familiar with that that he was wounded for our transgressions with the stripes we were healed uh, the Genesis 3.15, the first verse that promises a redeemer would come because of Adam and Eve. Matt? Abraham rejoiced. Before Abraham was, I am. Now, he said something that is very important. Why, like today is the Lord's table. Why do we do that? Why do we do the Lord's table? Why do we do that? Anyway, huh? In remembrance, all right? We observe the Lord's table. He said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. All right, so 
We remember what Jesus did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. The offering, notice chapter 10 and verse 1 again. It says this, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So it is obvious that, that it was a shadow of Christ to come. Dave's speaking about the offerings on Wednesday night and how that they are a, a good type. They're a picture of, of what Christ did for us on the cross. And my, my thing is, and I know that people disagree with this, and that's okay. I'm, I'm all right with that. I really do believe that there's before the cross and after the cross, we look back and we remember through, those sac through the Lord's table, the bread and the juice, the body and, and the blood of Christ, we remember those things, and we are reminded again of what Jesus did for us. Okay, so you're on the right track. You're on the right track. We'll discuss it more next week. All right, because I wasn't going to answer it today. But I just, you got to look at chapter 10. Uh, Ryan. Absolutely. I, I fully believe this, that there are multitudes of people who think they are going to heaven because they've been baptized or because they have, uh, or the, the Lord's table. I know lots of people who believe that the Lord's table is a means of grace. You say, what does that mean? Well, means of grace is that somehow or other, the Lord's table is going to get them to heaven. And it simply is not. Uh, baptism, people think of it. And there, I'm sure, I'm sure that there are all kinds of people, because salvation comes down to one or two things, do or done. It's either you got to do this and do this and do this and do this, or it has already been done. All right, so, uh, Sarah, I need you to do something for me. I need you, I need you to go unlock the back door. Because there are people trying to get in, and, and the back door is locked. And I thought it would have been, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Just tell Doug to look the other way when you go through. Sorry about that. Yes. churches tell them they are. I've never been to a funeral where there was any doubt that a person did not go to heaven. Mm -hmm. I mean, we... You're right. I, I agree with you. So many people put their trust in that person that stands up front, and that person tells them you're going to heaven, so why wouldn't you believe it? Uh -huh. Unless God moves upon you and you right. get convicted of sin. Right. I, I'm sure that all of you probably, like Deb, had been to funerals where the person was a scoundrel. And yet, they stood up there and gave complete assurance that that person was in heaven. You know, and, and that just... Right. 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 I mean, really. So, to answer Ryan's question is, yeah, there are lots of people who do lots of things who think that that is what's going to get them into heaven. And we've said over and over and over and over again, the only way to heaven is through the grace of God. That's it. That nobody will ever go to heaven apart from the grace of God. So, all right, anybody else got a question on that or a thought on that? If not, we are in Revelation today.
chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, we have been talking, or trying to talk about anyway, things to come. Chapter 4, verse 1, and when he was caught up, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter, the things which must come to pass shortly. Now look, if you would, at chapter 21. Chapter 21, chapter 21, and it says in, oh, let's see, somewhere in chapter 21, I'm looking for it, that it says the seal not up the vision or something along those lines. If somebody sees it, give a holler out, but it does say that when it said in Daniel, God said, seal it up, but he said to John, and I, John, fell down at his feet, thou sayest, worship God. Oh, verse 10, and he saith unto me, seal not the same that are in of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. All right, so whatever the prophecy was, in, and I think we've made point of this, that the prophecy, the only book of real prophecy in the Old New Testament is the book of Revelation. And so he says in chapter 4, verse 1, I'll show you the things which must be hereafter. And he said, seal not. Don't shut it up. He said to Daniel, seal up those things until the time of the end, where many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And so I, I, I have very little doubt in my mind of this truth that Jesus is going to come again, and he could come very soon, sooner than we may think. And then the seven seals. All right, so we're in chapter 4 there. Now, look, if you have a question, don't be afraid to ask uh, about it. Now, what is going to happen? What will happen when Jesus comes for the church? Now, we talked last week about the millennium. The millennium is the thousand-year reign of Christ. The millennium will come after the great tribulation. That seven-year period when literally in, the, in this, when, when, when hell will be here on earth. Literally, it, it is the, the seven trumpets are going to sound. And we're not really going to get to the trumpets just, or seven seals will be opened. And then the seven trumpets will sound. And then the seven thunders, which John is told, do not write them down. And then the seven vials will be poured out here on the earth. And when we look at the seals in chapter 6, in which we will shortly, when we look at those seals, a fourth of the people in the world, over two billion people, are going to be killed uh, when the seals are open. Two billion people. We can't even begin to fathom that. Two billion people are going to be killed. And so the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is not necessarily one day, but signifies that period of time when God's judgment, look at chapter 6 for just a moment. We're not going to go that far this morning, but in chapter 6 of Revelation, Chapter 6, in which it says, the kings, in verse 15, of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? You know, people today, they think they're pretty brave. They shake their fist at God. They mock God. They mock Christ. They mock everything about God there is, about heaven, about people who believe that. But there's going to come a day when they're not going to be laughing so loud. And there's going to come a day when they're not going to shake their fist at God, when they're going to cry for the rocks to fall upon them and hide them from the face of him who sits on the throne 
It's not going to be so funny then. People aren't going to be laughing then. So in chapter 4, uh, at the, which actually comes after chapter 3, but chapter 3 is the end of the church age. Chapter 4 begins that period in which we would call the tribulation. Now, some want to call it, well, only the second half of the tribulation is known as the great tribulation. And, and I know people, good people, good people, who say this, that, well, because there will not be a lot of real trouble during the first half of the tribulation, they believe that when the two Jewish witnesses are killed in chapter 11 and then they are resurrected, that's when the church is taken out. Uh, I don't think so. I don't believe so. The Bible calls it the whole, look at chapter 3 of Revelation and verse, chapter 3 of Revelation and verse, hmm, if I was in chapter 3, it would help. It tells this, uh, him that overcometh, that's not it, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Now, people say to me, Preacher, why do you really believe that Jesus could come at any moment? Why do you think that? Because there, look, let's face it, there are a lot of people who don't think that Jesus could come at any moment. Why do you think that Christ could come at any time? Why do you think that, why do you believe that? And I would probably suggest or say this, that if you're here today, you would probably say, well, I believe in the imminent return of Christ. By that we mean that Christ could appear for the church at any moment. There are several reasons for that. There are people today who used to believe that who no longer believe that. But verse 10 tells us this. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. So here's the verse that is a promise to keep us from that hour, and I believe that is used here in a figurative sense, not a literal sense. You remember we said, well, when plain sense makes common sense, seek no other sense, or all becomes nonsense. If we were to say, well, right there it says the hour is only going to last an hour, we know that that's not true. So here's a figurative part of speech in which it simply says there is a day coming. Look at 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians and chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians and chapter 1. And verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven. What are we doing? We're waiting. For his son from heaven. No, do you really think Jesus will come again? Look, I, I, again, I tell you, there are lots of people who say, well, I really don't think Christ will return. Well, what do you do with verse 10? It says that we are waiting for his son. I'm waiting. You're waiting. From heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, now notice, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, you can take verse 10 one of two ways. One, that he delivered us from the punishment, the reality of hell. He has delivered us from that. One of the things I read in Hebrews chapter 10 this morning was this, that... I'm going to read it to you again. I'll read it to you real quickly. That... Uh, purge our conscience from verse 2. For them would they have not ceased to be offered, talking about the sacrifices, because that the worshipers once purged should have their con no more conscience of sin. Once our sins are gone, we don't have to be conscious of them. Now, you and I are, are conscious of our sins still, but the glad truth of the matter is, and I, I know that people get upset when you say this. But it's Bible that our sins are gone. Now, I'm never going to be called to account. And so they'll take 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10 and say, well, that's what that means. 
It means that our sins are gone and that we'll never be called into account of them. And if you want to say that, that's good, because that is true. I've said repeatedly, and if you remember two things I've said, one is this, God is good, that's what God is, he's good all the time. Now sometimes we may not see the goodness of God in some of the circumstances that we come across in life, but God is good, that's what God is. The second thing, if you don't remember anything else, if I drop dead this week, and you say, well, what is it the preacher ever said? Well, number one, God is good. But number two, when you and I get to heaven, we'll never be called into account for our sins because either Christ paid for them all or he didn't pay for any of them. And the Bible is clear. It is expressly clear on this matter that Christ paid for our sins. Now, do we still feel bad about our sins sometimes? Well, if you have any kind of a conscience, you do. Paul said this in Romans 7, O oh, wretched man, the apostle, probably the greatest Christian this side of the cross, said, O oh, wretched man that I am. Now, that was coming from a Christian. Now, you and I can say, boy, I look at, if I were to say today, and I'm not going to say, I'm not even going to ask, because I already know the answer to the question. How many would say today, how many would say, if, if I said, show your hand, how many messed up this week? Everybody raise your hand. Because we've all messed up this week. That's just the way it is. We have messed up. But our sins are paid for. Now, now so the other thing in verse 10 is, which delivers us from the wrath to come, may refer to that time when Jesus comes for the church and takes us out of here. Now, I know that there are, there are people who do not agree with that and say, well, all you're looking for is a way out. If you're going to get married, or if you have been married, if you are that, Fellas, how many of you, the night before you got married, found your wife and beat her senseless? <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Now, I know that's not true, and if I see you again, it'll be a miracle after that. But, uh, <laughs> but it's like, you, you, no, you don't do that. Well, the marriage is tomorrow, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to beat her black and blue. I'm going to tenderize her. You know, I'm, uh, nobody ever did that. Now, you think about it for a minute. Why would Christ allow his bride to go through the great tribulation to be beaten and bloodied? I understand that through the centuries that has occurred, that there have been many martyrs for Christ. But if the marriage of the Lamb is to occur, why would Christ allow that? I, I'm looking at it in this way. Now, there are people who say this. Well, Jay, his name was John Nelson Darby. He was the Plymouth Brethren. They said, well, John Nelson Darby is the guy that developed the rapture. That isn't true. As early as the second and third century, the church leaders were writing about the fact that Christ would return before the Great Tribulation. It is not some new doctrine that we just came up with to get the church out of all the trouble that it's going to go, the world's going to go through. So we believe that Christ shall return and that he could return at any moment. And so chapter 4 then we have been speaking about in heaven. Look at chapter 4 in Revelation again. Chapter 4, we're looking at this. We are now in heaven. We are in heaven. The, la the last time uh, we were down to verse 4, around about the throne were 4 and 20 seats, or thrones, seats, and upon the seats I saw 4 and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. All right, so we're, 
the victor's crown. The Bible speaks about crowns, about getting crowns. We have sung, boy, do we sing, will there be any stars, any stars in my crown when at evening the sun goeth down? When I, something that, something in the haven of rest, will there be any stars in my crown? And the Bible seems to indicate, number one, that there will be rewards. Now, look at 2 John and verse 8. 2 John and verse 8. There will be rewards in heaven. Now, anybody ever get an allowance? Maybe it was only a quarter, but anybody ever get an allowance when you were a kid? Thank you, one person and me, me and Dave. We got allowances. So it was kind of hit and miss. Sometimes he'd give us our allowance, other times he wouldn't, but I got an allowance for, he said, okay, this is what I want you to do around here. Eventually, I'll say this, eventually my father made me pay room and board. You say, oh, that's horrible. Well, he made me pay, I think it was like $25 a month. You're not going to live anyplace else? No, he made me $25 a week. You're not going to live anyplace else for $100 to get all your food, get your clothes washed and everything else? Well, that's cruel and unusual punishment, preacher. Mm. Well, John, 2 John chapter 8, or verse 8, there is no chapter 8. Here's what it says. John writing says this, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. All right, so that we might receive a reward. We're all going to, and so shall every man give account of himself to God. Every single person in this room is going to give an account of themselves to God. At one time or another, at the judgment seat, or at the great white, everybody's going to give an account. Now, we need to be careful that we lose not. And we spoke about this that I believe our reward is going to be based upon two things, whether we have been faithful to the opportunity given, and secondly, why have we done what we've done? Why did we do what we do? Did we do it for ourselves or did we do it for Christ? When we're building the church, did you come over and do it for yourself or did you do it for Christ? When you sing, did you do it for yourselves or for Christ? If you teach a Sunday school class for yourself or Christ, when you hand out a track, why did you do that for yourself or Christ? For without me, you can do nothing. And if we attempt to do something without him, I do not believe that we'll get a reward. But even a cup of cold water, given his name, will receive a reward. So we want to make sure we get our full reward. And we want to make sure that we get some crowns. Because if you'll notice in Revelation chapter 4, Revelation 4, the four and 20 elders are a representation of, of, as best we can tell, the church. Twelve apostles, the twelve uh, tribes of Judah, 24. Uh, that's what they seem to represent, clothed in white raiment. Now, the white raiment is important because when we read in chapter, look at this, we've got to read chapter 19. Look at chapter 19 of Revelation, chapter 19. And it says this, in... Uh, chapter 19, great multitude. It says in verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness, talking about the bride of Christ. Now, this can be none other. It must be the bride of Christ, which is the church. It, it simply cannot be anything else. Notice, let us glad and, be, and rejoice and give honor to the Lamb, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. We are the bride of Christ. And we are clothed in that fine linen. So in chapter 4, those four and twenty elder, elders that are seated around the throne are clothed in white raiment or this white linen. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now in chapter 4 again, notice verse 10. The four and twenty elders fall down and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying. So these four and twenty elders, which seem to represent the church, clothed in this white raiment, which John again affirms in chapter 19, and a second time in chapter 19, if you read on a little bit farther, that this would be the bride of Christ, that the bride is going to cast their crowns back at his feet. 
I've heard people say this, and, and this is true to a certain extent. Preacher, I'll be satisfied if I just get to heaven. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? I'll be glad to be in heaven. You'll be glad to be in heaven. There'll be a great day of rejoicing. We'll be glad. It's in Corinthians. It says, then shall every man, saved man, every saved man, have praise of God. We're going to have praise of God. But then, then, you know, every man's work, and we spoke about that, shall be tried of what sort it is. Whether our work was good, were we faithful, why did we do it? Or whether it was bad, did we just do it for ourselves? So every man's work, not every man sins. Not everybody sins. I've said it, and I've said it, and I've said it. I said it today, I'll say it again. We're not going to be judged for that because there's only one payment for sin. So our work will be tried of what sort it is. Your work will be tried. My work will be tried of what sort it is. And it'll be tried by fire. People say, well, what is fire? I think the fire is the word of God. David was. David said, while I'm used, the fire burned. Jeremiah said, thy word was as a fire in my bones. So I, I'm going to take it that at this will be judged according to the word of God. All right? Now, there are several crowns. There is one crown that you cannot get. You simply cannot get it. And that's the shepherd's crown. And that's for people who are preachers, as far as I can tell. But there are several other crowns. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we'll start in verse 27. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27 says this, know ye not, verse 24, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. Hebrews chapter 12 says, verse 2 says this, uh, verse 1 says, how's verse 1 start? Somebody remind me. Hebrews 12, 1. Yeah, where, thank you. Uh, yeah, okay, I got that one. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the sin the, and the weights which doth so easily beset us, and let us, anybody know the next word? Run. Run the race with patience. We're not in a sprint. We're in a marathon. We are running the race. And so he says here in chapter 9, let us so run, run the race, the Christian life race, so that ye may obtain. Now notice what it says. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Uh, I, I remember when I was in high school, I, I remember this very clearly, that if you got caught smoking, they would kick you off the team. I think, if I remember correctly, they didn't even want, even want you drinking Coke. I don't know why, but man, that stuff, that, man, that, but anyway, now, if you're going to be successful in any kind of endeavor, sports-wise, and Paul uses this as an analogy here, you're going to have to train for it. You've got to do that. If you're going to be a runner, you've got to run. If you're going to be a soccer player, you've got to practice soccer. If you're going to be a ball player, you've got to practice ball. If you're going to be a football player, you've got to practice. That's what you've got to do. And Paul said they do it to, notice in verse 25, he striveth for the mastery to obtain a crown. All right? Now, their crown is corruptible. But notice what he says there. We and incorruptible. We are trying, we are striving for an incorruptible crown. Verse 26. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. 
What is the incorruptible crown? The incorruptible crown is, is for, I believe, those Christians who have, if the word is correct, striven, if that's a word, they strove, they strived, they tried. Now, nobody in this room is perfect, and we all know that. But they attempted, they endeavored to run the Christian race so that when they get to heaven, and God's going to look at us, and the Bible commands us, let us run with patience. These people attempted to run the race to live the Christian life. It doesn't say that we are perfect. Far from it. But let me ask you this question today. You think about this. Are you attempting to live the Christian life? Are you trying to? Because there are multitudes of people who simply said, no, look, there are multitudes of people who at one time were in the race and just gave up. You know me well enough, I think, I hate losing. I don't care if it's tiddlywinks or uh, hopscotch, I hate losing. I don't like to lose. I never like to lose. I, I just don't. Now, you may not be that way. Now, some of you are, I know. See, so looking around. I hate losing. I hate it. I hate losing to my wife in Scrabble. I hate losing to my wife. If I'm going to lose to anybody, it's not going to be my wife. I'll guarantee you that. But anyways, but my... The problem is that my wife is pretty smart, and she can beat me, and that's why I hate it. But anyway, so it's like I hate losing. I hate it. I will do anything then in my power to win. And God says this to me, and he says it to you, that all of us can get this crown if we attempt to run the race, if we try to bring our bodies into conformity with the Word of God. Are we going to be perfect? Absolutely not. Nobody is. And a lot of Christians get discouraged over that. Well, I tried to live the Christian life, preacher, and I have failed. I read in Proverbs somewhere this past week that a just man will fall, but he'll rise, he'll get up again. Did I ever fail? It's like, it's like playing baseball. Did I ever strike out? Absolutely. You do realize that Reggie Jackson, as great as a, as a home run hitter as he was, and he was a tremendous home run hitter, Reggie Jackson struck out the equivalent of every time at bat for five straight years because he struck out over 3,000 times, and they figure you'll get up about 600 times in a season. He struck out over 3,000 times. But he's not remembered for striking out 3,000 times. He's remembered for hitting home runs. Do we fall? Absolutely. But we get up again. Now, here's the, the great thing about you and I. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, look at this. Galatians 5. If I could live the Christian life without Christ, why would I need to be saved? I wouldn't. But a just man will fall. You'll fall. Everybody falls. I'll, just, I'll, say, I'll say this. One of, my, one of my previous problems was I had a, I had a very... I had a really short fuse. You know, I just short fuse. Uh, I'd blow up, get it short fuse, blow up. But I, I would blow up, you know, kind of quickly sometimes over the silliest things. I mean, just silly things. Well, over the years, by the grace of God, not by anything that I have ever done, but by the grace of God, I've been able to get by that. Do I still get upset sometimes? Eh, once in a while. 
but I'm striving. I'm running the race. I'm trying. I'm striving for mastery. You say, well, preacher, how can we do it? Well, look at chapter 5 of Galatians. Here's the great thing that you and I have. Here's the thing that helps us more than anything. It tells us in Galatians chapter 5, I am there, and it tells us this. Uh, uh, my Galatians? I wrote 6 next to the chapter 5 because I wrote Romans eleven six. 6, so I'm in chapter 4, but anyway, you'll get it. Here we go. Verse 17, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Here's what the Bible tells us that everybody that is born again, every saved person in the room today, the Holy Spirit lives within us. They say, preacher, how can I tell? People often say, preacher, you know, I... What is it, preacher, in us that would indicate to us that we're saved? What is it, preacher? Well, one of the things was First John we saw last week, chapter 3. Hereby we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. All right? We love everybody in here. You may not like everybody, but you love everybody. Here's another thing. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. I can tell you for a fact, and so can most of you if you can remember. Now, if you were saved as a little child, it may not be quite as obvious to you. But I know that before I was saved, very little, if anything, ever bothered me about what I did. I mean, next to nothing ever bothered me. The Bible says this, that our conscience become seared. Did you ever, you ever have a bad burn? I mean a really bad burn. I mean it, it, it burned. I have. You can stick a pin in it. I still have no feeling where the burn was. That's the way it is when people, their conscience becomes, uh, what's Proverbs, what is it, 27-1 or 29-1? He that hardens his heart, oftentimes being reproved, the more you harden your heart, the more hardened your heart becomes the less receptive you are to uh, the, the pleadings of the Spirit. It's like hearing. I've punctured my eardrum several times uh, from bad earaches. One time, old Doc Hunt, he took a string, and I think the string was about that long, and shoved it in one side and out the other. But it was about that long, and he shoved it down through my ear because it was so infected to keep it from closing shut. Now, your eardrum will hear, but where the scar is, sound will not pass through that. So the more often you break your eardrum and the more often it heals, heals up, the harder you become of hearing. So as Christians, you know, we, before we're saved, before we're saved, nothing ever, nothing really, I'm really, Hardly anything ever bothered me about what I did in my life. But after I got saved, man, that Holy Spirit of God, man, you do something wrong now, he's all over you like a, I mean, probably a man, but he's all over you. I'll just leave it there. The Holy Spirit is all over you. Did you ever do something wrong and then immediately the Holy Spirit begins to convict your conscience? So he says, how do I know I'm saved? Because you've got that Holy Spirit inside of you convicting you where it never did before. Here he says this, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Notice, jump down to verse 14. It, or, I'm sorry, verse 22. We were in verse 16. How do you jump down? But anyway, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, or goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh and the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, which we are, we are alive because of the Spirit of God. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. All right. So we want to obtain the incorruptible crown. Dear friend, I want you to know this morning that the incorruptible crown is well within your reach that you can get the incorruptible crown. How do you get it? By simply saying, all right, I'm going to do my very best to bring my body into subjection to what God 
intended for me to do. Now, there are going to be people who get to heaven, they won't get the uncorruptible crown. Remember, we're looking at Revelation chapter 4 where they cast their crowns at his feet. I want a crown. I want to be able to have something. People say, I'll just be satisfied to get to heaven. No, you won't. No, you won't. I am somewhat convinced, maybe not totally convinced, that when it says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, or 21 and verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, I am somewhat convinced that there will be tears in heaven up to some point. When people look at their lives and say, boy, I, hey, hey, how about that song we sing? By and by when I look on his face, I wish I'd given him more, more, so much more, more in my life than I ever gave before. I'm telling you, when you get to heaven, you'll never regret one thing that you ever did for Christ. Never regret it. Never. All right, look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We want to live in the Spirit. We want to live in the Spirit. We'll get to this one, but we will not get to it very far today. We're out of time. Here's a second crown. Blessed is the man, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Here's the second crown, which the Bible expressly says, the crown of life. Who is it to? To them that love him. Do you love him? Yeah, preacher, but I fail. I didn't ask you that. Do you love him? Do you love him? Do you? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. See, when we love him, when we love him, when we love him, that will keep us. When we truly love him, we'll keep it from loving others. All right, we are out of time. We'll have to start again next week. Father, we thank you again for another day. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy to us. Thank you, Lord, that you loved us first. It wasn't the other way around. We loved you, then you loved us, but you loved us first, and we love you. Lord, help me to love you more. Help each one of the dear folks in here to love you more. So that by and by, when we look on your face, we won't say, I wish I'd given him more. Lord, help us to love you, to love you, with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind, we pray. Bless the next hour, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.